We're delighted to introduce Professor Richard Bernowski, respected former diplomat and specialist in international relations. His expertise in foreign affairs, communications, and as an author of a book on Australia's nuclear ambitions, sees him well placed to discuss the consequences of Japan's nuclear disaster, the subject of his forthcoming book, Fallout from Fukushima. Please join me in welcoming Richard Bernowski. Thank you, Jan, and I'm very, very pleased to be here, and I've really been stirred up by David's film, that last one. Uh, I thought there was wonderful... Um, uh, the way the story progressed was particularly good. I, I'm going to tell you about three things tonight. Firstly, the present situation in Japan post Fukushima. My wife, Alison, and I went there last October. Secondly, I want to talk to, to you about the international implications on the nuclear industry, the international nuclear industry of Fukushima. And thirdly, I want to come back to the rather schizoid position of Australian politicians on both sides of the House and others, and how outrageous this is and how, how, how I feel so indignant after spending 34 years of my life representing this country and many countries to come back and have what looks like now a travesty of political debate, it just as appalling. Yes. Let me begin with... Yes. Let, yes. let me be... Yeah. You are the future. And you had too many chocolate cookies, but that's all right. Japan, Japan is in a deep state of confusion. Uh, in October, I went to uh, Fukushima and I went down to the coast and I saw all the devastation along the coast of the tsunami. I listened carefully to senior officials in Tokyo uh, who I had access to. I heard very carefully what Yoshihiko Noda, the Prime Minister, was saying about whether we should reintroduce and bring back nuclear power in this country. I remember very well what his predecessor, Naoto Khan, the Prime Minister, had said. He was an anti-nuke, and so was his Minister for METI, the, METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, uh, Yukio Edano. Edano, thankfully, is still in the Cabinet. Uh, Yoshiko Noda is much more milk and water and much more soppy about nuclear power and says we must bring it back, we, 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 for our economic well-being, we have to have it back. Right now, 53 out of 54 nuclear power plants in Japan are closed down. There's one unit, unit number three in Hokkaido, the Hokkaido Power Company that is still operating, but it's going to close down in May. So you'll have zero nuclear power in Japan for the foreseeable future. And we must not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that Japan continues to be an extraordinarily powerful economy. It's the third biggest economy in the world, it still is. And they went through the last northern summer with only about 50 or 40% of the reactors working. It didn't stop families watching baseball inside their air-conditioned houses. There were no blackouts across Tokyo or across Japan. Production slowed down, Toyota, <laughs> Unions in Australia are saying, don't buy Japanese cars because they might be radioactive. And I've just bought a new Prius. It's the first trip I've done with it today, and it's a lovely car. I haven't run a Geiger counter over it, but the fact is that you don't know where cars are produced anymore. I mean, you know, I think this is produced in Japan because it's fairly specialised engineering. In Fukushima itself, I called on... I, I, we went to some se a senior high school and we talked to kids who'd been made nuclear refugees from near the plant. And they were, they, they were trying to be upbeat. They were trying to say, in a little town called Yabuki, they were trying to say, look, you know, we're going to be all right. We, we, can, we can, look, we can't see it, we can't feel it, we can't smell it, we can't touch it. This radiation is not as bad as we thought, it's going to be all right. But they can't go out and play on the baseball pitch gamma rays are coming out of the ground and they had to play in the, in the gymnasium. And when we talked to a group of mainly girls and boys, 17 year olds, full of life, 
with their future in front of them. They were determinedly upbeat, but one girl almost burst into tears and she said, I can't, I can't, leave, the, I can't leave here because if I go anywhere else, I'm going to become a nuclear re refugee like the Hibakusha, the, the victims of the uh, atomic bombing that Wilfred Burchett was talking about. And no one will marry me. And even if I marry here, how do, how do I know if my kids are going to be any good? So there's that, there's that underlying feeling, you see. And people in the Fukushima province and the other provinces surrounding it, because God knows how far this radioactive clouds went, and they went a long way, I can tell you. I could go through all that if you like. But they, they, they think, what, what can we do? And they have to take a decision. It's an existential decision. Do we stay or do we go? And if we go, where do we go? Now, the people who've decided to stay include a young, energetic, English-speaking professor of radiation who runs a clinic at the Fukushima Medical University, Professor Sato. And Sato is determinedly upbeat. He's got young kids, he lives there, he said, look, he said, a lot of cesium-137 landed in the hills around us. We know that, but he said, you don't eat mushrooms, but he said, just about everything else is okay. And I'm going to stay because I've got a job, I've got my wife, I've got my kids, we've got a lovely house, we've got a great future. And another fellow, Billy McMichael, who's a Nisei Canadian, who speaks fluent Japanese with a machine gun rapidity, uh, and who works for the local council, he said, look, I'm staying too. His wife was having a, a, a baby right then in Nara, in the southwest of, of Honshu, and he was going to go down and bring them back. And he could drive to and from between Fukushima and Nara because the government had taken away the tolls that you have to pay on the, 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 high, the, 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 the super expressways for anyone from Fukushima to try to compensate, I guess, for the discrimination that people had found from surrounding Japanese neighbourhoods. If you had a Fukushima number plate, you were lucky to get served petrol. Because people still think, a lot of people still think in their ignorance that radiation is somehow infectious and you can catch it. And it, it's a very, very sad thing to think. On the other hand, you've got the refugees, the people who've left. Lots have left, like the hero in David's film, you know, no, we're not going up to uh, so Roxby Downs, we're going to stay here. He's thinking of his future. More people have left than have stayed. There's still 30,000 refugees from the, the, the coast just east, of, just east of Fukushima City that haven't come back and won't come back. The place is in a mess. And yet, as I said, they've survived with their electric power. No blackouts. It's funny how the Western press descended on Japan after Fukushima, and many in their ignorance are trying to compare it to Haiti or to a third world country. <laughs> Japan is sophisticated, they can look after themselves, damn it. And they're very good at doing so, often with American assistance, although the Yanks had to hose down their aircraft carrier, the Ronald Reagan that was offshore. And the Yanks, of course, are very worried about their bases. This uh, nuclear plant southwest of Tokyo called Hamaoka, has three reactors and they're building an enormous tsunami wall to try to uh, protect it from future earthquakes. I don't think they'll start it up again. It's too dangerous, it's too close to the Tokyo metropolitan area. You could not evacuate the people from Tokyo. It would be impossible. And furthermore, the Yanks have bases there and they don't want their bases radiated any more than they have to be anyway. So we have confusion, we have anger, but above all, what we're having in Japan now, finally, is the mobilization of a good deal of indignation among the Japanese people, with writers like Ken Zaburo Oe and um, Murakami. Murakami and other people like that. They're beginning to coalesce into angry groups which they've not done before. It's amazing. The Japanese have been slow to anger. They're very disciplined people. I generalise here, but the generalisation is probably more true in the case of Japan than any other country I've served Australia in. 
they're beginning to slow burn and really become quite indignant. And the government is very fearful of opening any reactors because of the, the, the backlash they're going to get from local communities, and that's happening. My guess, and I say this in the book that's coming out, my book that's coming out in September, is that nuclear power has 10 more years in Japan and it'll be over. And what's going to replace it are renewables. Coming up on the Shinkansen to uh, Shin Shirakawa before we went up to, uh, to, to, to Fukushima, you can't see volt photovoltaic cells anywhere. You don't see any wind turbines because the nuclear village the nuclear Mura, the village which consists of the big companies like Sumitomo, Hitachi, Toshiba, Mitsubishi, Mitsui, all these companies and the government, pro-nuclear government like the Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry and, and the nuclear regulatory people and the companies that have a monopoly on the supply of electricity around Japan, there are 10 of those companies, all of them have discouraged any other form of energy. And they've, they've had the mantra that nuclear is safe and you've got kindergartens and, and nurseries and playgrounds around the reactors saying how safe and clean and green nuclear power is. They've been vastly discredited and the people are becoming very indignant and I think that you'll find that it's going to phase out. In this mighty country, they're going to turn to renewables. They're going to have photovoltaics right up the eastern coast of Honshu. They're going to have geothermal power from the towns, uh, from uh, under the towns where you've got hot spring resorts in the Fukushima area, in the Tohoku region. You're going to have tidal and wind and it'll happen. Uh, Germany is pointing the way, the Germans, which is the largest economy in Europe as we know, and Japan, what a team, if they could get this thing going and discredit even more the outrageous claims of the nuclear industry, of Mike, which Michael Angwin in this film, that, that, that mealy-mouthed pro-nuclear head of the nuclear uranium export industry in Australia. I've tangled with him before and by God, I'd like to again. Uh, he, he's, he is being discredited as well. So that's Japan. Around the world, you find that the less democratic the country, the more likely they are, they are to go nuclear. The Czech Republic, Poland, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Turkey, are all thinking of putting in nuclear power plants. And so is Vietnam. I served as ambassador to Vietnam in the 80s and I can tell you that they don't have a great deal of, of democracy in that country. And I think the government will, can, will say we're gonna have them. And, and the, the Korean nuclear industry, the Korean nuclear industry and the Japanese to some extent, although they've been badly bruised by what's happened at Fukushima, are very gung-ho about exporting their technology. Korea just beat the French in providing three nuclear plants to the United Arab Emirates in the Gulf. And the head of Arriva, the French company, lost her job, the president, because she didn't get the contract. It's a very, very ruthless business that's going on. But when, when, you, when you look at the forecasts of the World Nuclear Authority, which is the propaganda outfit for the nuclear industry, they say there are 45 countries that are just about to go nuclear and they're going to save the world from global warming, which, quite frankly, is bullshit. The fact is that nuclear power, even if suddenly you expanded it double, triple, three times, even if all of electricity generated in the world was suddenly, by some miracle, generated by nuclear power, that accounts for 18% of carbon emissions. It's oil and transport and cutting down forests that accounts for 82%. So the, the, the people who say, you know, it's an answer to global warming are just ignorant or liars. And I have to say to you that I'm optimistic that, that the countries like Germany and I think Japan and, and Italy and Sweden and Austria, and, and Indonesia. Uh, President uh, Bambang Yudhoyono has just been in Japan where he announced that he would not have nuclear power plants as were planned on the Muria Peninsula in Indonesia because it's too damn dangerous. It's a bit like the same as, as Japan. 
and others are going to follow. I th and and the, other, the other fact is, of course, that the, the cost, the upfront cost of nuclear power plants is astronomical and growing all the time. And I do, if you could just hold this for a minute, I just want to read. Admiral Rickover was the head of the Navy uh, research unit in, in, in America when it was the US Army that bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki with their B-17 B aircraft, B-29 aircraft, I'm sorry. Admiral Rickover decided that he wanted nuclear power for the Navy as well, as huge inter-service rivalry between the Navy and the Army. So he began what has become the pressurised water reactor. That is a reactor that you can you can miniaturise and it doesn't heat up so much because you're using water both as a coolant and a moderator. And he developed a pressurised water reactor system to drive American nuclear submarines, of which Nautilus was the first and Nautilus went under the North Pole. And then he, he lined up with Westinghouse and started building pressurised water reactors. Anyway, Rickover... quite a realist. And he said there are two types of reactors in the world. This is in the 1950s. An academic reactor is simple, small, cheap, light. It can be built very quickly. It is flexible in application. It requires little development. It uses off-the-shelf components. It is in the st study phase, and it, but it is not being built now. Then you have practical reactors. These are being built now. They're behind schedule. They require an immense amount of development on apparently trivial items. They're very expensive. They take a long time to build because of engineering problems. They are large and they're complicated. And that's what we have now. And so we've got a nuclear industry trying to fool us that generation three and four and five reactors are going to be a lot safer than the present bunch. And, and the, the apologists say, including Michael Angwin, that Oh, look, the Fukushima, six Fukushima reactors that are now offline, three of which melted down, that's old technology. In the United States, of over 100 reactors, a third of them are exactly the same technology, built by General Electric. And there is much difference between these reactors. I try to fool you to say, look, the new ones are better, you know, passive cooling systems, um, fail-safe warnings, etc. There's still human error, they're still tightly coupled. If you have an accident or have a, an oversight by an engineer, it quickly escalates out of control. And it will again. And some of the new reactors are already finding critics who are saying, look, these are not safe. And I think that nuclear industry is going to be found to be wanting and found to be as dishonest as it really is. Talking of dishonesty, now let me talk quickly turn quickly to Australia. Prime Minister Julia Gillard has just been in Korea at the so-called Second Nuclear Safety Conference, which was uh, prompted by 9-11 in 2001, and the Americans suddenly realised, Jesus, these terrorists could come and, and drive a, 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 an airliner into a reactor. What are we going to do about that? We've got all the, this, uh, the terrorists are going to use the material and make a dirty bomb or even create a nuclear weapon. We've got to safeguard this. And so in 2009, President Barack Obama had the first nuclear safety conference in Washington. And now we've had another one in Seoul, Korea. And the Koreans, of course, have used this very cleverly as a propaganda platform for their own nuclear technology, saying, look, you know, the Japanese technology wasn't very good, but ours is much better, buy our reactors. That's all in the corridors of the main meeting, the main plenary, in which they've been trying to say how we've got to improve the nuclear non-proliferation regime and we've got to uh, safeguard materials much better than before. And that's what the Australian government are rationalising with Muckety Station. The fact is, though, that uh, Julia Gillard stood up and in the most sanctimonious speech I think I've heard her give, talked about how we in Australia have a much better record than any other country when it comes to protecting our uranium. And she quoted some authority that had said that. The fact is 
that in 1997, 1977, I beg your pardon, John, uh, Malcolm Fraser handed down into federal parliament bilateral safeguards arrangements that would apply to the export of Australian uranium. They were pretty tight. But over the years, by Fraser, by, by, by Hawke, by Keating, by Howard, they've been, they've been compromised by commercial considerations. And how dare the Prime Minister, who is fairly ignorant and has a tin ear when it comes to foreign policy, should claim such a thing when our uranium is being sold to China, to Russia, now to India. India is not a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. How dare we continue to tell the Australian people with a straight face that Australian uranium is safe and we are responsible. If it's safe, why don't we have reactors in this country? What the government realises, and will never admit, including, including Marne First, the Minister for, what's his name, Martin Ferguson, the Minister for Resources and Energy, what they don't admit is the rather cynical and laconic and passive feeling of most Australians that we don't bloody well want reactors in our own backyards. But the shame of this is that most Australians think, oh, yeah, it's all right to export, but we're not going to bring the stuff back either. And the reactors at Fukushima, just as all the other 50, 48 reactors in Japan, were basically fueled at least to 40, 50% by Australian uranium. And that will continue. And Japan has one of the largest supplies of plutonium separated from those reactors to make bombs, plutonium-239. You make it from uranium-235 or plutonium-239. And here we are, talking about as if, you know, we're responsible. To my mind, we'd be more responsible if we voted differently in the United Nations and supported some countries like I think Switzerland, New Zealand, Brazil, South Africa and others who want there to be a nuclear weapons convention in which all nuclear weapons are outlawed, including the 19,000 nuclear weapons held by Russia and the United States, a thousand of which are on hair trigger alert. If that could be done, if we, if we took that sort of line, I'd have more respect for the present government and the opposition, but unfortunately it's not happening. Meanwhile, Makati Station, all right, that's, it's, it's, it's a travesty. It's destroying the Aboriginal rights and territory, which happened at, at Maralinga. Maralinga was a disgrace. The British dropped the, used, used the bombs there with Bob Menzies' agreement. And it wasn't just the detonations of nuclear weapons, but it was what really did the damage was testing a nuclear weapon in a bomber, taking off, and then they'd explode the bomber to see whether if it crashed, there would be a nuclear detonation. And what that did was scatter plutonium all around the surrounding countryside. Now, there have been four or five so-called cleanups of that material, and it hasn't worked. Still, people cannot camp anywhere near that, that site overnight. They have to leave it because there's too much plutonium around. So we've got Maralinga, we've got, we've got uh, Makati Station, I have to say to you that I would like to see a repository in Australia for low-level waste, that is, uh, radio pharmaceuticals, which are in many of the hospitals around Australia, all brought together in one place. It's low-level radiation, but as Helen Caldicott says, it's all cumulative and buried in one place. But do you know where I'd like that to be? As David Bradbury said, I'd like that to be at um, Lucas Heights. And I went to talk, when I was writing my book, Fact or Fission, I went to see the head of Luke, Luke, Lucas Heights and I said, uh, what are you doing with all your, uh, your high-level waste from the Haifar reactor that they had operating there and the Moata reactor before it? And she said, well, first of all, it's not high-level waste, Richard, it's, it's medium level. This is semantics. The fact that its, it, its temperature has gone down slightly doesn't mean that it's any less radioactive and it's full of all the uh, actinides, all the transuranic elements that are so deadly and th that kill. It's, uh, at present, it's, it's, it's in above ground storage within the, uh, the Lucas Heights establishment itself. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but it's going to be very hard to try and find somewhere else to dispose of it. But let's bring everything else and put it there and say, all right, you guys look after that. 
Incidentally, it's interesting, for those of you who've been to Lucas Heights, there's a, there's a, 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 um, a zoo in the front of, the, of Lucas Heights, or there used to be, with kangaroos in it. And this is to subliminally show to people that, you know, it's really safe. It's like what the Japanese do. It's very safe. I think, therefore, having said what I've said, I, I have a degree of hope and optimism that despite the chicanery of our government, the worst state of the opposition, the greed and concupiscence of the uranium miners, and most of them are not Australian, BHP Billiton and Ranger and the rest, um, despite the forms of, of, uh, of extracting the uranium, it, it's either an open cut mine, it's going to be at Olympic Dam, or even worse, uh, in situ leaching, where they pump down an acidic solution into the ore bed and then they bring up what they call a pregnant liquor through another pipe and then they beneficiate that and take out the uranium. Leaving behind in the ground near the, uh, near, near the artesian basin highly radioactive material. It's almost as bad as the dust that collects with radon in it on the surface. I can't predict the future. I can only hope. I think that the Japanese are brilliant people who are seeing the light of day and might be a catalyst, a catalyst for change. If Germany succeeds in continuing to develop its economy, or even just stand still, and this is something the Japanese are beginning to, to think too, why do we need much more? You know, we're a very rich country, we're very rich people, we've got washlet toilets, which... <laughs> Which, which, which allow you to, um, uh, they're a bidet within the toilet itself. It's a very sophisticated system. You go to Japan, it's really quite an experience, I tell you, to, to use one of those. And many young Japanese are not going on tourism trips overseas because they go to countries that don't have washlets. They've got to have washlets. But I do think Japan is a, an ins could be an inspiration for us. I just hope that the mafia, the international nuclear mafia and the Japanese nuclear mafia don't prevail. Finally, you've all heard of the Lowy Institute, run by Frank Lowy, financed by Frank Lowy. Uh, <laughs> Martin Letts is the deputy director of the Lowy Institute. She used to be a colleague of mine. She was ambassador in, I think, Brazil or Argentina when I was ambassador in Mexico. Martin is a very bright woman, but she's driven by a pro-nuclear agenda. And she's often said, and this was even before Fukushima, we must have an objective debate, Richard, in Australia about nuclear power. What, that's shorthand for saying, we've got to stop all these emotional greenies from getting involved. We've got to just have a calm, rational debate by those who know what's going on. And as Helen Caulicott had said, Helen, if you can't get emotional about nuclear power, what can you get emotional about? Uh, I, th I think though that they have had four seminars, the so-called objective type of seminars since Fukushima, and Michael Angwin from the uranium industry was there for one of them, but what I, what I detected was the emotion of these miners. They're so angry that their own, their, their own technology is being downgraded by what happened at Fukushima. They're so angry on behalf of their shareholders that they can't, that the share price is dropping. They're so angry that people won't see that this is the wave of the future, you know. It's thoroughly dishonest, but there it is. That's what we have. I have no hope for Australia. I think Bob Brown, for the time being, I think Bob Brown did a very wise thing by resigning when he did because Tony Abbott, unfortunately, is going to be our next Prime Minister, in my view, and when he does, the Greens are going to be stuffed for some time to come. I hope not. Christine Milne, I know well, I think she's a, a strong and, and brave woman and highly intelligent, but we just have to wait to see. But if we can have more community groups like you, who I have, have the privilege of talking to today, around this country, develop and coalesce and continue the indignation and grow it. If somehow we could get the Murdoch press to back off, that's, a, that's an impossible ask. Uh, we might be getting somewhere, but. I guess all I can say is from my point of view, I continue to be asked to talk on SBS and ABC and different television channels. And so there are some people who want me to come back even though I say messages that the establishment 
don't like at all. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions or accept any comments you've got. It's only just five o'clock. I think we've got 10 or 15 minutes, Jan, have we? So thank you very much anyway.